Our first um, major stop was Winton where we had a couple of nights and we went to the um, world of dinosaurs. This is where they, um, the restoration area and one of the ladies who was on our trip with us in actual fact is going up there next month to spend a week, uh, a month volunteering there, preparing the, uh, the fossils that have been found. They have um, a lot of volunteers working there. And this is the um, Lark Quarry. This shows the dinosaur stampede. And you can see these are the small um, animals and these are the larger uh, dinosaur footprints. And this is in a covered area. Um, so it's quite a big area as well. And outside, that's outside uh, the previous slide, and you can see how big they're all life size, or what they think of a life size dinosaurs. And they think that's what the stampede would have looked like. And the Winton show was also on. You know, you you luck upon these things when you're travelling through country towns. And um, this was a typical country show. There was the um, the chook display and the decorated uh, biscuit display with the children and um, the sculptures. Uh, lots of there were lots of things to see. And they start them very young in the country. And we then headed from Winton across on the Plenty Highway and it goes across to Alice Springs. Is that right? I'm looking meaningfully yeah, at it my... Yeah, it is. Um, it's it's yes. called the Plenty Highway because there's plenty of corrugations and plenty of dust and plenty of holes. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of the many road houses. Um, Cobb and Co used to use this as a staging station to change their horses. And that carriage that, uh, that you can see there, that could have had up to 12 people in it. So um, I guess people back in the day were smaller than we are now, uh, but it would have still been very crowded. Yeah. Not very good springs and you might be on it for three days going somewhere. Go. It's no wonder people needed to recover when they got to wherever they were going. And it's quite an extensive um, area that Cobb, oh, yikes, um, that, that Cobb and, sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an extensive area that Cobb and Co covered um, back in the day. That's their, that's their roots in Queensland where they were running regular coaches um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And that was a sign um, out the front of the... Um, in the pub. In the pub, yes. So the first one is this Middleton. The spontaneous answer is I hope so. And the serious one is yes. Um, and there's a couple of quite amusing ones there. Where do the kids go to school? The music one. Oxford University Middleton and the actually one Mount Isa School of the Air. <laughs> <laughs> is the water okay to drink provided the pig is clean um, and it comes from a boar, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is Tobermory Station which I think you've got no people there. Um, this was quite unusual because of, there was so much green grass. Um, we stayed at a few stations like this and lots of them have got um, people, international visitors working at them because they have to do, a lot of the younger ones now to get an extra year on their visa, they have to work for 80, 60 or 80, 88 days. 88 or something da days, in yes. In the middle of nowhere. Yes. So they work in the, at these stations. Um, a wonderful experience. Yeah. So Tobermory is just over 
the Queensland border into the Northern Territory. It's not far in, and if you want to see some, if you want to see some great shots of it in flood, it, you can just you just Google them, and it's got a great big. Um, it's um, a great place. Run into a camp. Levy bank. Yeah, that's it. Mm. Got, a, got they've got their own private levy bank all the way around. Uh, you can see that for miles and miles and miles, it's just nothing but water. It's family owned. <clears throat> it's family owned, and it's six thousand four hundred square kilometres. Mm. So it's pretty big. Yeah. And the Plenty Highway is part of the outback. Way and it's also known as Australia's longest shortcut because it goes from um, it links Winton in Queensland to Laverton in Western Australia. That's another place. This is more typical of the places we stayed. This is Gem Tree, um, and you could go um, fossicking there for ru rubies. No, not rubies. No. No. Garnets. 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 Like yes. That. Yeah. Lots of red dirt. And that was the the state of the road. The road wasn't too bad, in spite yeah. of what Brian said. And I think the most expensive fuel we had was, um, that's $2.80, and that's at Gem Tree. And that was the 13th of June last year, so just 12 months it, ago. It, that's before the prices went through the roof. I don't know what it would be out there now. Yeah, it was $3 in Nullarbor a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. We saw mainly three trailer road trains but there were some four trailer road trains. Um, and some of you are probably aware that, you know, if, if the truck driver sees you behind them, behind you, behind him, and it's clear to go to pass him, he'll flash his blinker and you, you just go, which is quite frightening because <laughs> you, you, you can't see. So you just trust him and, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> fourth trailer tends to move about a lot. Mm. So three trailers aren't too bad, but when you put that fourth one in, it, it goes, it goes all around. across the road. It throws rocks everywhere. Yep. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the longest and the heaviest road trains in the world, apparently, and our road trains are up to 55 metres long. Now this was our first challenge. Um, we were staying at um, Ross River Homestead, which was um, about 100 kilometres east of Alice Springs. And we were sitting around the fire and it was getting dark. And, oh, one, and, a, and one of our party, the only sober one, I should say, <laughs> of us who hadn't been, well, who hadn't been drinking, stood up and he tripped over a log uh, in front of him, and he went into the fire. Oh, God. Did a hand plant in the fire? In the fire. Probably not a face plant. Yes. Oh, and um, we got him out of the fire very quickly, but he was, you know, he, and in everybody had Telstra phones except me, and I had Optus, and mine was the only one that worked, surprisingly. Yeah, well, Optus has put a, a few dedicated cells out, out towards Ross River. Mm. Well, yeah. all through the Northern Territory, they've done a deal with the Northern Territory government, yeah. and they must have all the Northern Territory government's phone business in return for whacking mm. in these remote ones. So mm. the Optus reception throughout the NT was really good, mm. much better than Telstra, which yes. is unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we got onto the ambulance and, oh, first of all, we got him in water and we, we think we probably had him in his hands in water within about 90 seconds of getting him out. And uh, we got onto the ambulance and um, they met us halfway and um, took him to hospital, to Alice Springs Hospital, and he stayed there for a couple of days, had some surgery, and then he flew back to Concord, and 
um, he was in hospital for six weeks in Sydney. And, um, yeah. But then we... Um, so, was he one of the solo drivers? Was yes, he? yes. So what happened to his vehicle? Well, <laughs> that's, his vehicle. <laughs> that, that's his vehicle there um, and his camper trailer. And we, you know, we had to do something with that. And um, his son found this man here, um, who is a retired he car... looks like your husband. <laughs> 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 oh, the other guy. Oh, the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's older. He's older. Yeah, 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 yeah he's, he was older than you. Yeah, yeah. He's a retired car dealer. <laughs> and um, he... That's at Alice Springs Airport. We picked him up on Tuesday at lunchtime, handed over the keys, and on Thursday evening, he had the car and the camper back in um, the garage where it belonged in Sydney, and he charged $1.50 a kilometre to bring it back. Mm. And that included his airfare to get to Alice Springs and his accommodation and fuel so um and he sent us photos he was sending us photos the whole time he was coming back and he put the car and the camper through a car wash so um and then when he'd finished doing this job he was taking a car and caravan um from melbourne to um perth and then he was coming back and taking somebody's car and caravan from Brisbane up to Cairns. So um, this is what he does. So, um, the gentleman's son, he found, I don't know how he found them, but because um, we didn't have a clue what we were going to do. But um, yeah. Well, that's one more of you because you're going to take the car. Well, that would have been me, so, yeah, yeah, well, don't worry, that would have been... <laughs> yeah. You, you would have been really happy to drive a manual 79, Well, I could have, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that, that sort of discombobulated us a bit. Um, but anyway, um, we continued on into Alice Springs and when we got to Alice Springs, Brian and I both had phone calls one Saturday afternoon from Westpac. And, you know, you're always a bit wary about your bank phoning you and all this sort of thing. Anyway, it turned out that our credit card had been hacked and um, they'd been, it had been frozen. And so <laughs> on the Monday morning, we had to go into the bank and... Um, spend an hour and a half in there getting, you know, digital whatever they do, um, so... Enabling the digital card so we could use our phones. And uh, uh, we're so technologically challenged, the poor woman in Westpac took over an hour, I think, to get both of us sorted yeah. um, and get it all set up. And we had to do that because the nearest place they could get us replacement credit cards the next Westpac bank oh. after we left there was Exmouth in WA. It doesn't matter, it had taken three weeks to get the coding done anyway. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you have a different card with a different bank or something? Backup card? Oh, oh yeah, you suggest. <laughs> 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 well, we had Amex, but they, you know, lots yeah, of places yeah, don't, don't take, take don't take Amex. Yeah. And but we had debit cards. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, yeah. Um, and we continued west, that's Stanley Chasm, um, and then we went to Kings Canyon. And yeah, the weather set in. We were going to go to, and I can't remember the name of it. Palm, um, Palm Creek? No, Palm, not Palm Creek, no. Um, it was Palm Valley. Soggy Palm, Valley. Palm, Palm Valley. Where Albert Namajiri used to paint. And we were going to stay Herman's camp Bay. there, but uh, no, there not Herman's were, Bay. There were a couple of creek crossings going in there, and it had started to rain, and and it was forecast to be raining really badly. So we decided to go straight on to Kings Canyon from where we were camping before, um, and stay extra nights there, which was just as well, because after we got in there, 
for one day the road into Kings Canyon was closed because the creek was up and <laughs> swamped and flooded. Yeah. Fortunately, Kings Canyon's the caravan park's got a, a really nice dining um, dining area. So and happy hour starts at three o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. So. <laughs> So you can stay happy for a long time. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it was really cold when we were there. Oh, it really was bitter. Really cold. And, um, but we did, some of us, some of us walked around, around Kings Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, and that gave my new knees a workout. Um, it was the hardest walk I've done since I got them. It's, but, but it was great, wonderful views up there. Um, once you got up to the top, and that's mm. the wall of the canyon there. Mm -hmm. What time of year were you there? June, late June. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. <coughs> mm. mm. It's supposed to be dry at that time of year out there, and, and we got a, a storm front that came in through, uh, came in through Kununurra and all up there and swept right through the centre and across into the southeast of Australia. So it went all the way across. And that's down in the valley of the canyon. Yeah. And the weather, um, it stopped raining. Um, we missed seeing waterfalls on the rock, unfortunately, but um, we walked around the rock one day and um, it's, I don't know if you know, but um, Uluru is sandstone and it has, um, it's about 550 million years old um, and the bulk of it's underground uh, and the colour is from iron oxide in the sandstone. And it's about 11 kilometres round the base, I think. And um, the maximum temperature the day we walked around it was 10 degrees, which was good temperature for walking, but it was, yeah, it was pretty cold. How cold did it get overnight? Uh, we didn't have a thermometer, so can't be actually sure, but bloody cold, yeah, yeah. I think. It's the yeah. best way to describe it. And when it's wet too, yeah. it's really miserable. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we're on a powered site and we had a blow heater. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have it going all night though. Yeah. Um, it did fine up. So we went and um, saw sunset at Uluru. And it's um, fascinating the way the colour changes. And we went to Katajuka. And that's granite, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Granite and, the, and basalt. Of granite. Yeah. yeah. And there's 36 domes. And it's about 40 kilometres from Uluru. Interesting walk down into the middle of that valley, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. It's lovely. Mm. Yeah, we did that walk up through the valley, mm. which is quite a short one. Yeah. We, uh, uh, the, there are much longer and more challenging walks, but that was challenge enough for us. Mm. We've got a series of uh, emergency telephones, which are VHF radio behind them. Mm. Oh, uh, don't remember seeing those. Well, you should have. They're big signposts, didn't they? Oh. Supplied by Carrera Communications here in Sydney. How long have they been there for? Oh, they won't work here. <laughs> Ten years at least. <laughs> no, <laughs> we just just on communications. We had taken a satellite. One of our party had a satellite phone, um, which we fortunately didn't need, and um, the same party also had Starlink. So, um, and we'd all camp together and. So we could hook up, hook up to Starlink via her, her Wi-Fi. So um, it, it's just Starlink. I, it just blows me away, it's Starlink. Okay, okay. Hmm. 
And then our third challenge, um, we had wanted to go across, um, as we said, the Great Central Road, but would you like to tell yeah, this so story? We're in, we're in Uluru, and when we got to Uluru, the Great Central Road was closed because of this rain depression that came through and everything. And every day we were waiting and going, we'd call in at the police station and say, is it open yet? And they'd say, no. And, and, and then the day before we were due to leave, we went in the morning and they said, oh yeah, the Great Central Road's open now, you can go, you can get through Docker River. Anyway, by the late afternoon, the Great Central Road was closed again <laughs> because um, uh, it was okay in the morning, but the flood came through down the Docker River and um, there were nine vehicles had to be pulled out of the floodwaters and fortunately the council were out there with big trucks and everything and able to do it but so they closed that road again so we had all these bookings in uh, you know swimming with the whale sharks and all that sort of thing up in the northwest um, so we had a time problem then and we decided that we couldn't wait any longer and then we'd just have to go down down the highway to Port Augusta and then zoom across the Nullarbor which is which is what we're doing. We're just going through Cooper Pedy and there's the opal opal mining signs of the opal mining on the right. I mm, know oh I'm right, I'm fine. Thanks. Yeah. And by this stage we were down to two vehicles because um, well we had somebody in hospital in Sydney and um, one of the other single men was only on the trip because he wanted to go on the Great Central Road and because he couldn't do that he was sick of driving the Nullarbor so he came home yeah. and one of the ladies, um, her daughter was pregnant and having some issues so she wanted, she came home yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> so it ended up just being two cars, two cars then which was fine, yeah. which was fine um, and that's a sight that nobody ever wants to see. Not a good sight. We were about 50 k's from the South Australian West Australian border um, when uh, suddenly the car lost power, went into limp mode as we discovered later. Um, and so we pulled up beside the road and um, uh, lifted the bonnet and got out and looked and said yes there is an engine in there um, which is about the limit of my car repair skills and uh, uh, so he we said well we've got to keep driving and so we were able to link limp through in the first instance to border town which is right on the border um, and I talked to the people there and they said well if you if you call road service here they'll be coming from South Australia from Sejuna and we thought well that's not a good idea for us because we still want to get to Western Australia. Um, so we continued on to Eucla which is only just down the road and pulled into Eucla and Eucla had the advantage of um, one being in Western Australia so you got RACWA and um, the other one was a, has a tow truck. So that that's the closest you get to a mechanic out there between Sejuna and Norseman. Um, and anyway, we had um, blown the engine up, thrown a piston, whatever you call it, and uh, the, there was only one way out of there, and it was either a scrap the car, drive it off a cliff and hope for the best, and uh, we did. get insurance claim. We had all these things suggested to us. Um, we were like deers in the headlights. We didn't know what to do. So you didn't drive off the cliff? No, we no. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what day of the week was it when this happened? Saturday afternoon. <laughs> John, yeah. Yeah. It's always Saturday afternoon, isn't it? Or it's Friday afternoon after five o'clock. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, anyway, so we have NRMA Premium and I hope everybody who goes bush has NRMA Premium because it's a fabulous service and we used our three thousand dollars of NRMA premium to defray the tow to Kalgoorlie. Um, not all of it, um, we had to pay nearly half of it. Um, the tow truck driver 
uh, gave us a car to drive so we didn't have to spend all day in the cab with him, which was great. And he towed our camper trailer. So there we are, leaving the Eucla Caravan Park. And nine hours later, we were into uh, a caravan park in Kalgoorlie. Um, and we got to Norseman and filled up. And as, as we were filling up, as I was standing there with the petrol filling it up, past goes our car on the truck. And he'd left after us, but he caught us up by then. I don't think he stopped. I don't know what he did about his bladder, but he, he just kept driving. And so he was right behind us when we got into uh, Kalgoorlie. Um, and so we set up our camper trailer. Um, we took the car over to uh, the dealer we'd selected, Kalgoorlie Four Wheel Drive. And um, um, Golf we left the car outside there because it was Sunday afternoon. Uh, locked it up and um, and he put his his the car have we driven down he just put it on the back of the truck and he headed straight back for Eucla. Uh, I don't know what time he got back to Eucla. And we had contacted Toyota in Kalgoorlie because that's a really big Toyota dealership and they couldn't look at the car for three weeks. Um, so <laughs> they recommended this crowd called Goldfields Toyota. So that was four wheel drive. Yeah. So that's where we had the car um, taken and they were terrific. They were yeah. fabulous. And we, we decided on a new engine and new turbo rather than reconditioned because, you know, who knows what you get when you get a reconditioned engine. Um, so we had to wait eight weeks for a brand new engine to come from Japan. Uh, there were none in Australia. And, um, and so we, Sue's cousin came out from Perth and picked up us and the camper trailer and took us back to Perth. We had a bit of time with them and then we flew back to Sydney for six weeks and, uh, uh, ringing Goldfields four-wheel drive every day and saying any news <laughs> he must have really hated me by the end but uh, in the end it all came together and they rebuilt rebuilt the car and everything and we went out and picked it up uh, we came back flew back from Sydney and got the train out to Kalgoorlie picked up the car and then we um, had to drive drive it around for a bit Get so some cases. So why didn't you fly to Kalgoorlie? Um, cost is the main thing. Okay. We okay. we flew we flew back from Perth on frequent flyers, mm -hmm. and we flew back to Perth on frequent flyers, mm -hmm. and it cost us a hundred dollars for the two of us at old people's prices to get the train out to Kalgoorlie. Okay. Yeah. And it's 600 kilometres from Perth to Kalgoorlie and the train takes six hours and it was, you know, it puts us to shame with our um, long distance trains here. It was really comfortable and, um, yeah. yeah. It's worth the experience anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you uh, like East Perth train station? Um, no, we got on at Midland. Midland, oh, yes, right. we got on. They <laughs> did a refurbishment of East Perth. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Mm. And that's our new engine. It's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, bit, a bit cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> we were pretty excited to have it back. <laughs> were, were, you, were you insured for Oh no, you can't get insurance for that. That's normal wear and tear. Your comprehensive insurance doesn't cover it. Yeah. Travel insurance, none of that. No, no. <laughs> no we've, never, we've never had travel insurance in Australia. Local, and yeah. I don't know if that would cover it. If you're an insurance company, you can't really cover it because who's going to know if you're both putting oil in it? Mm. Yeah. So rather there's a question about did you work out what actually happened to the motor? Did they tell you? What went wrong? Uh, there was probably no point in them telling me exactly what went wrong. <laughs> um, 
Through a uh, piston, that was all, whatever that means, that's, that's what we were know. told. Uh, yeah. It kept running in link mode with the train. Yeah, piston. that's interesting. It kept yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also, well, can you ask roughly how much it costs to replace the engine? <laughs> cost to replace the engine? Yes. Um, it was around about... Twenty. Twenty-two thousand dollars. Ouch. Ouch. And, and it was the best deal for us because uh, we, we would have got next to nothing for the car. We would have had to pay another two thousand dollars to get it to Perth to an auction house. And then, and then probably might have got five for it, um, which gave us three. And then we go out and buy another 2010 Prado with 250000 on it for $22,000. So we figured it was better. The best deal for us was to put the new engine in. And you've also got those extras that you put oh, under the We, we had, got, had a lot of extra, as I'm sure, you know, lots of you do have lots of extras on your vehicle. Yeah. And we had our trailer, which we had to get home as well. Yeah. So we would have had to... Have, so when we did all the sums... Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, it, it was, that was quite the bullet. And the, the hope is, of course, that this, if this engine gives us 250,000 kilometres, then we won't need a... Prado anymore. <laughs> so have you done the trip report for the land cruiser? Uh, <laughs> no, we're not, we're not the <laughs> and then we had to put 1,500 kilometres on the engine before they recommended we towed the trailer with it. So um, we decided to go north um, and we went up to a place called Gwalia which um, is an old, very old gold mining town. And um, the first mine manager there was Herbert Hoover, yeah. who went on to become the 31st US president. And um, so that was, that was quite interesting. And we, um, they worked the mine 24 hours a day and fly in, fly out, or drive in, dry out, because drive in, drive out. It's um, pretty much a ghost town, Gwalia, these mm. days. Um, and the yeah. mine... Yeah, um, there's another town just down the... not far down the road, a small town. Yeah. And we stayed in Herbert Hoover's house, which is now a BMB. Yeah. <laughs> And that was the uh, what Gwalia used to look like. It closed very suddenly in 1963, I think it was. Somebody was killed at the mine and they just decided to close it overnight and it was just deserted. And there's a lot of buildings still there. Everybody left the next day. <clears throat> and you wonder how people would leave. You know, this is a place where they've been living and mining and that sort of thing. And then you go and have a look at their conditions they were living in and there was one guest house we looked at and they had two beds in each room and they were just corrugated iron, no insulation, no nothing and there were I think 20 odd men lived there and they had one toilet and one laundry out the back and they had a, um, a kitchen where all the food was cooked at the guest house and it was almost all cooked in wood-fired stoves. So what the temperatures would have been out there in the middle of summer, I wouldn't know. Or in winter. In a tin shed. Yes, in yeah. a tin shed. Yeah. Um, one of the houses we looked at, the floor looked like it was timber at first, and then you realised what it was. It was made out of dynamite cases. So the wooden cases for the dynamite, and they pulled them all apart, and that gave them a wooden floor. And then you stack them, you stack them together didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was the state hotel hotel which the government built and that's herbert hoover's the house that was built for herbert hoover on the right but he never actually stayed in it and it's now b and b which was very nice and that's the super pit in kalgoorlie and gold was discovered there in 1893 
And so far, um, 1,700 tonnes of gold has been mined there. And that's self-explanatory. And then we went down to Wave Rock, which only became a tourist attraction in the um, 1960s when a local high school teacher entered a, photo, a photography competition and um, it ended up being, uh, it was from, the photo competition was um, from New York, I think, and um, a Kodak, uh, competition and um, he won it and his photo ended up on the front of National Geographic and um, the, the tourist industry just took off in the town after that and they get about 130,000 visitors there a year. And there's a, a feature there called um, the Hippo's Yawn and that's about um, 13 metres tall. Yeah. It looks like a hippo, John. Yeah, it, it did actually, yeah. Standing on his yeah. 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 And we stayed at a, um, a resort. Called himself a resort. Resort, it was, yes. It yeah. was a whole heap of uh, two and three bedroom <coughs> apartment um, buildings. Yeah. yeah. And there's this that's a salt pool and um, you you can't sink you, you it, it's really really salty and it's got a dirt dirt bottom and um, these little buildings around the side there inside each of those is a shower and a toilet so that when you come out you can wash all the salt off you because you have so much salt on you and it's amazing when you're on holidays, what you come across. And this is uh, Lake Dumble, Dumble Young in the southwest of um, Western Australia, east of Bunbury. And that's a record of Donald Campbell's Bluebird in which he broke the world water speed record on Lake... Lake a replica. A replica, yes. Um, because he broke the record on that lake. And it's an interesting it's an interesting story. He'd broken the land speed record that year in South Australia. On Lake Eyre. On Lake Eyre and and he was determined that he would have a go at the water speed record in the same year. And so there he was over in South Australia and they had too much rain and the the lake he was planning to do it on was not at all suitable. And anyway, this farmer over there, over in Western Australia, heard about this and said, oh, he could do it on Lake Dumbledore. And so he rang them up, and uh, as in, this is the 1960s, it's before the road across is tarred and everything, and they said, all right, we'll come. And so they packed everything up in South Australia and they drove all the way across to Lake Dumbledore and, and they set everything up and the weather was never right, there was too much wind and all this sort of thing. And then finally on the afternoon of the 31st of December, um, it all cleared down and everything and they said, right, let's go. And they went and they did it. They broke the world water speed record. And so Donald Campbell is the only person ever to have broken the, the, the two records in the same year. And we didn't have a clue it was there, so. Mm -hmm. um, that's Cape Lewin Lighthouse. Um, yeah, it's, it's still a working lighthouse. It's 39 metres high. It's the tallest lighthouse on the mainland. There's another one on um, King Island at Cape Wickham, which is um, taller. So typically on uh, Lighthouse Weekend, we work these guys. These, guys, these guys are always on mm. here. Yeah. yeah. We swam in two oceans. Oh, okay. Yeah, apart. 
Right there. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. It was pretty wild and windy when we were there and cold. Did you pack the sharks? <laughs> and then we were in the valley of the giants and the red tingle trees and they're massive massive trees they live for um more than 400 years and um they are, are unique just to this small area of the southwest of western australia and you used to be able to park a car in uh, the buttress roots of one of um, these trees on, on the right there. And um, that is actually us on our honeymoon in 1977 uh, <laughs> <laughs> with our car parked in the tree. <laughs> so we did our bit to contribute to yeah. the death. The, the death. Right. <laughs> the drive, the <laughs> the roots were shaky. <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, yeah, so the the tree fell over because it just got so the ground just got so compounded with everybody parking their cars in it, and unfortunately, we probably contributed to it. You can't drive from the one they're open now, but it's just as big, and I think probably have anyone even bigger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the, they've built um, this series of metal, stainless steel yeah, the walk, treetop walk. Tree walk through, um, through the forest. And there were a lot of volunteers um, standing at uh, different points along the walkway with lots of information. So it was, um, it was very well done. Mm. And then we were down at Albany, which was, uh, went to the, whaling station which is quite sobering down there um, between 1952 and 1978 14,600 sperm whales and 1,500 humpback whales were harpooned and processed here um, at their peak they supplied 60 percent of the world's market for sperm whale oil so um, yeah and that is a pygmy blue whale which beached in Albany in um, 1973. <clears throat> uh, the average length of the pygmy whales is 23 metres and they weigh 82 tonnes. And that's the Gap and Natural Bridge. Uh, the photo on the right is looking looking straight down into the water. WA seems to have done a lot of this sort of stuff. You know that that walk and the the bridge hang and the overhang, and and the other one they've got in Calvary, and then there's the treetop walks and that sort of thing. And we didn't get to it, but there's also a granite tour which you can climb up, and it's. Uh, um, quite spectacular views and everything and they've spent large amounts of money creating these these um, uh, natural naturally enhanced natural views I guess you'd call it. You talk about the Granite Skywalk up in um, the Sterling Ranges there. Yes. Yeah we did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We didn't quite get up there. I was hoping to but And that's a natural bridge. You used to be able to walk down there till somebody got washed off and died. Yeah, we've got yeah. a photo down there in a honeymoon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do, actually. <laughs> and this is part of the Bibbulmun, Bibbulmun track, which goes from um, Kalamunda, which is a suburb outside of Perth, round to Albany, and it's um, 952 kilometres. So we saw a number of people walking it, and um, when you finish the walk at either end, you finish at the visitor's centre, and they've got a bell there which you go in, and the staff ring the bell and um, make a bit of a fuss. So um, it's certainly an achievement to, um, to walk it. 
and there is a, an amazing National Anzac Centre um, at Albany. Be it was opened in 2014. Uh, there were um, 41,000 Australian servicemen left Albany to go to um, the Middle East uh, during for the First World War. And it's very, very moving and really well done. We were each given a card of somebody to follow as we went around. Brian had... Um, uh, an Allied chaplain and I had a German soldier who we followed their story around through through the war. And in the category again of you never know what you're going to find when you're on holidays. This 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 this, <laughs> this is <laughs> and that, in a, yeah, that's right, just in a cow paddock in the middle of nowhere near Esperance. Pardon? It was commissioned in 2009 for, an Aus for the Australasian Granite Company um, and they got into trouble after not very long and um, it was then purchased by another company and the project was completed in 2011. Um, it's an exact replica of the English Stonehenge and it's um, aligned so that it um, catches the summer and winter solstice and it's built from Esperance pink granite. So, and it's just, as Brian said, it's just in the middle of a paddock, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. It's a, unlike, unlike the poor example in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a lot better condition. This one is actually complete. <laughs> <laughs> and it's maintained. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you get druids there? Yeah, they do have druids. Yeah. They do yeah. that. They yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that's Lucky Bay, uh, reputed to be um, Australia's whitest beach. And there were lots of pictures of kangaroos on the beach, but there were no kangaroos there when we were there. But there were people swimming in the water, and you're allowed to drive down onto the beach. And yeah. I was so they're there. competing against the, that island, White Island, in Red Sunday. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Jarvis, Bay. Jarvis Bay, yeah. I that was the one. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you all probably know what this is. Telegraph station. Station, yes, at Eucla. That's actually the second telegraph station at Eucla. If you go very closely and read the bottom of the sign, it says, oh, this is the second one. The first one's actually 50 metres to the east of here. And so I went orienteering and managed to, after 10 minutes, 30 minutes, to find it. Only 50 metres away, but there's still some foundations of the original first telegraph station there. Right. Mm. Uh huh. That's what, across to South Africa or somewhere, isn't it? I don't know, we're not connecting to it. No, no it was across, it was to, across, to, across oh, to, okay. Perth. to Perth. Oh, okay. The, the first telegraph line across. across and the that's Perth. in Euclid. Yes. Yeah. Right the, One of the stations. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, it's only a few cases off the highway. Yeah. And that's and that, the old jetty at Eucla. Yeah. So that's how they used to supply the telegraph station. And that's all that's left of it. Oh. So this is only way back now, is it? Yes, yeah. Yes, we'd gone back to Perth and we'd had the car serviced and um, picked up the trailer and then we headed back. Yep. So you didn't fall in any caves on the Nullarbor? No, no. <laughs> no. Any whales down there? Or? We were just at the end of the whale season and uh, we were at... Uh, um, head of the bite. At, no. Yes. There was one whale wow. there, but all you could... There was a mother and calf, but they were so far out you couldn't really see them. You could just see a bit of black in the water. Black, yeah. 
And this is the longest uninterrupted sea cliffs in the world. So. And um, <clears throat> the first picture is in Queensland and the second one is on the Nullarbor. Um, the road is used as a landing strip for the RFDS and there's, you know, every, I don't know, 20, 30 kilometres there's these signs and um, I guess the road's kept in a bit better condition yeah. in those areas. Yep. And there's supposed to be aeroplane to turn off the road after it finished landing. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> it both ends? Yeah. And yeah, a couple of different shots of the road. It's very straight, isn't it? Yep, yeah, very straight. And flat and yep. Yeah. And <laughs> that's the longest golf course um, in the world. It's an 18-hole, 72-par course. <laughs> and you can buy, you can buy a, you know, you can play it. And um, it was... Um, the idea was hatched over a bottle of red wine at the Balladonia Roadhouse in 2006, and the idea was to get people to stop and, um, you know, have a rest, have a break, and, of course, spend money at the Roadhouse. Did you run into the naked Sheila? <laughs> No. No. <laughs> no, I saw all the, all the posters and, and discussions about her. Yeah. It's really rough, though. I mean, oh, it's really I rough. started with two golf balls and ended up with five different ones. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. was one of the better holes. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> And then we went down onto the Air Peninsula to Coffin Bay and um, oysters, yes. Um, they trialled growing Sydney rock oysters, but it was too salty, the water was too salty. And so they've ended up with Pacific oysters and that's, um, they've proved to be very successful. And this, this, this was in the caravan park at um, Coffin Bay and um, every afternoon these guys would come and wander through. <laughs> And Brian will tell you about this. Well, that's that's in Peterborough. Who's been to Peterborough? Yeah. yeah. I, we, we lucked in on coming to Peterborough. It was a day's drive from uh, Coffin Bay. So that was where we were stopping. We were well and truly on our way home. We closed up the camper trailer. It wasn't going to be opened again until we got home. And we stayed in the caravan park there. And we got in there. I might just add, it was really, really cold and really, really windy. So I said, right. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I just followed instructions. So we, <laughs> we were staying in the caravan park at a cabin and, uh, and the lady said to us, oh, you should go down and have a look at the, um, have a look at the museum um, and they have a sound and light show on tonight. So we uh, went to the sound and light show and... Uh, that was um, that was terrific, and the the interesting thing about Peterborough, it's the only place in Australia where three rail gauges meet. So there was the there were the South foot, South Australia five foot three inch main gauge, which is the same as Victoria, and then they had uh, three foot six for the northern part of South Australia because they or three foot. They wanted to build cheaper railway lines, and they could build more railway lines that way. And of course, then the um, uh, the standard gauge came in from New South Wales, um, and they used to get the ore trains into Peterborough from Broken Hill, heading towards um, the port, and um, they'd have to change the gauge. And the way they changed the gauge is they had the five foot three carts lined up and they'd bring in the ore cart from Broken Hill and they had the navvies shoveling the ore from one to the other yeah. by oh. hand. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So, so there were a lot of people who lived in Peterborough back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and this, is the, this is the... Um, turntable. Turntable for, for all the cars. 
and they've got a, they've got this fabulous Rad musician museum there. And when we went to the Sound and Light show that night, we go to the next one. Well, you've got it. Oh, I've got it. Haven't I? <laughs> Over to me. You see this steam engine, and you get all this stuff going on in there, and smoke and things, and it's, it's pretty cool. Vivid with steam. And, yeah. Yes. And, and you go and sit in one of the cars on the turntable and they light up all these other cars over there and it talks to you about all the different Very ones. Nice. <laughs> and, and they've got all these different carriages and great stuff there. And we went back, we were so excited, we went back the next day before we left, I was so excited. Yes, <laughs> we went back, went back the next day and we had, went through the whole museum then um, and had a look at it. And, you know, look at these old it's rail funny. cars. Mm. Just, just magic. Mm. Um, and, and so we were able to go through all of those rail cars that are in the, in, in the roundhouse. And there you are. Okay, we saw quite a lots of wind farms, um, and but mainly no mainly in Western Australia. Um, and uh, the bottom left photo is from Ningen, which is um, one of the largest solar farms in the country um, at this point. Um, and it produces enough electricity to service 42,000 homes. And there were sheep, as is often the case, there were sheep grazing underneath. And the wind turbines are massive. Mm. And there were quite a few charging stations along, you know, that we saw. Um, and we saw one Tesla on the Nullarbor. Um, so I, I don't know how that driver would have gone because there's no charging stations from the West Australian border to Sejuna in South Australia. They probably had a generator in Gary Cabin, the boot. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been plugging in at his overnight, overnight motel. Overnight motel, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, and that's some interesting signs. The, the, the one on the top Calibre left <laughs> and the one on the, um, the left says, please close the toilet lid. Frogs are attracted to water and snakes are attracted to frogs. <laughs> so, and you know you're in the country where you see, you know, signs for firearms and ammo. That one doesn't say ammo, but we did see some. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the Hilton Hotel was at that was at Middleton. Um, um, no, surprisingly not. <laughs> and I thought the Broken Hill Sea Scout group was amusing. So <laughs> and it's the third Broken. The third, yes, that's right. <laughs> And there's these signs all over the place in Western Australia, and we saw them recently in Queensland as well. So if you have an emergency, if something happens, you ring the emergency services and you quote that number, and um, they know exactly where you are. So um, good, I so, really good yeah, idea. Another yeah. alternative to the three-word yeah, thing. Three yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we were away during spring. Oh, oh whoops. Oh. And we saw lots and lots of wildflowers. So, um, which was very pretty. That was a highlight for me, actually. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. Uh, we were not anywhere right at the peak, but some lovely wildflowers all over the place. Mm. Lots of waratahs in Western Australia which was surprising. Um, so, any... <laughs> any questions? Any questions? I sort of asked all night along the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? There's another mini wave rock, uh, of a few different rocks, but one of them has a nice wave on it, over on the Air Peninsula as well. 
All oh, right. Yeah, if you go inland uh, a bit uh, from Coffin Bay and Streaky Bay and those places, yes. there's, a, there's a series of granite outcrops that are similar. Oh. One of them is called a big rock. We walk right around over. Not, mm -hmm. not as big as the West Australian one. No. Mm -hmm. what, what sort of planning did you um, put into this lovely trip? Planning? <laughs> <laughs> How did you know, you know some of your drop pins you know, along yeah. the way? You uh, have some sort of... Just Brian spent months reason, working I on spent, them. I spent months building a spreadsheet. Right. First mm. of all, building a spreadsheet for the Kimberley. And I had all of these places we were going to stop and all of these things we were going to do up there. And, um, and then after the, that massive cyclone came through and destroyed all the roads and closed all the parks, we didn't know in January, we were going in June, we didn't know what would be open, if anything. Mm. Um, and as it turned out, there was that other storm came through and we would have been up there probably then anyway. Um, so we decided then that we'd go south, so I had to go and rejig the whole thing. Um, and um, yeah, so, and that's when the Great Central Road came into being. And then, of course, that blue, and they are ferocious in WA. All of the tourist places, nobody gives you a refund for anything at all. And uh, no. but you've almost got a book six months ahead, or you don't get on the boat, you know, and that sort of thing. So, just what about it is. permits and things like that? Uh, yeah, permits. We needed permits for the Great Central Road. Yeah. That was the main permits we needed. Oh, of course, national parks permits. It was worth buying a, a one-year national parks permit for Uluru because we were there for more than three days. Um, and we bought one-year permits for WA and for the Northern Territory as right. well. So were the permits for the Great, the Great Western Road or where? Uh, the Great, Great Central, Central Road. There were two yeah. Aboriginal communities that... Yeah. So uh, did you have to get... Or yes. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. nobody checks you, you know. So if you okay. got your permit and and that, and you happen to be you you only have three days to get yeah. from Docker River to Laverton. Yeah, I, I only have same, two nights. I had the same problem when we went across yeah. there, except we got across there and then it rained both sides of us. No. Mm. Mm. Right. So we had to just wait two weeks yeah. to be able to get back mm. out. Ah. And yes. Had to go back east. And in some ways, the rain did us a favour because if the the car trouble had happened, um, we could have been on the Great Central Road, and that would have been even even worse yes. than what it was. So. When you did have the car trouble, the people that you were with just had to keep on going on their own. Well, yeah, there was well, only uh, one uh, uh, one driver. One, yeah. one driver with us, and she kept going. Yeah, Judy kept going yeah. on her own. Yeah, she was the one with Starlink, and yeah, uh, she's one of the most capable four-wheel drivers mm -hmm. I've ever known. Yeah, so, yep. So she did make it in the end? She oh, did, yeah. yeah. She, went all, <laughs> she went all the way around. Okay. She had a 200 series. Yeah, pretty pushing on by your by your own face off, though. Uh, well, she's, she's very capable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, she only did one road thing. thing. We're, not, we're not talking about off-road. No, no, but still, if something happens, it's done. Oh. Some would be along in five minutes. Yeah. She had a Even satellite phone. Simple, okay. Still, there's a lot, a lot yeah. of traffic. A lot of traffic. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That, that, yeah. We weren't going on any any roads mm. where you we we need convoy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah Judy, Judy only did one bad thing. She told us we should stay two nights at least at Fowler's Bay. Right. Did you go to Fowler's Bay on your way back? No, we were told to avoid it. Oh, that was wise. <laughs> I wish we'd been told. <laughs> I, I, I thought even Fitjuna was a bit down like a... <laughs> <laughs> compared to Streaky Bay, but we didn't, we didn't want to push on the other hour. Yeah. Fitjuna's mm. nice. Any, any other questions? Oops. No, I've just got a couple. Oh, OK. <laughs> the photographs you took were great. Thank you. Were they, uh, did you have a camera or was it just the phone? Did it was you, on my phone. It was a fantastic. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the other question is, where to next? Where's the next adventure? <laughs> <laughs> Not owning up yet. <laughs> Not planning yet. <laughs> oh, planning? we're starting to think about stuff. We're, we're going to Kangaroo Island later this year, but we're not taking the camper trailer for that.
Um, mm. So uh, that's a September. Cost twice as much of a period as the Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're yeah. nice, but... Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. I, I, when we went to the Flinders Ranges, I was looking for some good four-wheel driving and the only... You've got to pay for it all. Yeah. On the yeah. properties and everything. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not the skyline, there's only so many rocks you can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, compared to the high country... Mm. Yeah, it's um, pretty boring. It, it, yeah, you, it, all, of, uh, all of these places. So even, you know, going to Cape York or, or what we did, it's a damn long way between a decent bit of four-wheel <laughs> driving, mm. whereas you're down in the high country and you could spend months down there yeah. and not travel on the same track twice. We, we saw yeah. the Golden Spike, and I'm mm. talking about that tomorrow night, actually. Yeah. Uh, the geological era, um, which is in the middle of the Flint Ranges. The only one in the Southern Hemisphere. Oh. 79 Golden Spike that marked the geological era. There's only one in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's there in the middle of the Flint Ranges. Mm. No, we right. talk here or we just stumbled across it. No, no. No, no, you've no, just got to talk to yourself into another talk. Only five minutes talk. <laughs> <laughs> I would congratulate you, Brian and Sue, on excellent timekeeping. Thank you. Yes. And, and for a very informative <laughs> talk. So thanks very much for coming along. Fantastic. Pleasure. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank 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 you.